Okay, so let's go ahead and um, we'll get to our, our next panel. Um, so our, our third panel for today addresses um, an issue, as a couple of the commentators have mentioned, a couple of speakers, uh, Alaska Native issues were left largely out of the, uh, the Constitution and um, are still not fully addressed today. And so we thought it was important to uh, have an Alaska Native perspective on the Alaska Constitution. Uh, Partially in the interest of time, I'm not going to introduce the speakers. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but also I think in part because their, uh, their experience informs their perspective. And so I think it, it's helpful to have them introduce themselves as they introduce their uh, topics. And I'm not sure if you decided which one of you is going to go first. Okay, so of course the first person to go doesn't really need an introduction, but I will turn it over to Willie Hensley. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers of uh, this event uh, for including this section uh, in, the, in the discussion uh, on the Constitution. And uh, I must say that uh, <clears throat> a lot of us are still, even at this stage, uh, discovering those aspects of our past that have helped shape our present and uh, how we'd like to try to maintain as much control of our future as possible for the sake of our children. Is it possible to speak up a little or either possibly stand at the podium? Uh, there's some people in the back that are having trouble hearing. Okay. Thank you. Should I repeat what I said? <laughs> I, I have a natural kind of a quiet voice. Uh, it's, I think, inherent. Uh, in, in, in any case, um, and George Washington University me. And uh, I just wanted you to hear uh, our language, uh, one of our ancient American languages, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is the fact that I'm proud of the fact that in spite of the best work of the government, I still managed to maintain, you know, something of our traditional language because it was, uh, of course, governmental policy to try to eliminate it, uh, as well as the churches that did a lot of their legwork for them in the early days of our educational system. And uh, also, uh, the, one of the other reasons is that uh, uh, it helps reflect, I think, the gap of understanding. Uh, that is, the fact that we indigenous people who had occupied this space for over 10,000 years uh, were essentially in a twilight zone of, of the mentality of those who created the Constitution. Uh, I have looked at uh, some of the videos that, uh, 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 where the participants of uh, the Constitutional Convention were waxing on about that experience, and it was maybe in their lifetime a wonderful and a great experience, and, and it's true. Uh, but it, it in no way uh, reflected you know, the total Alaska population. And of course, I, kn I know the participants, many of them, uh, John Cross was uh, representing Kotzebue, and John was a wonderful pilot. But in no way could he have been reflecting the Inupiat people of that region when it comes to our, our thinking and those issues that were important to us. Anyway, uh, and uh, many of us even to this day, are just learning about the, our own histories. Because basically it was the job of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to make sure we didn't know who we were. Uh, and um, uh, we did not understand the ferocity of the, the first colonial period uh, on the people uh, of uh, Alaska, particularly uh, in the Aleutian Island region. Uh, the Sukhbak area of the Kodiak in the Gulf, uh, 
And uh, the tremendous loss of life that took place, uh, the the dis essentially the destruction of a people through, through disease, through starvation, through enslavement. Um, and the people essentially were being utilized as labor to hunt the low-hanging fruit, the sea otter, for the Russians, literally, literally all the way down to Catalina Island off the coast of California during that century and a quarter that uh, they were here. And uh, uh, in, in the battles that we had over our space uh, between 66 and 71, really most of it has virtually no knowledge of not only the history between 1741 and 1867, but virtually nothing after that of any consequence because it wasn't taught. And, and so we we're basically, uh, when we got into the battle over who owned Alaska, uh, we were really, really fighting with one hand <laughs> behind our back because we were literally ignorant of that history that was so key to forming our arguments uh, before Congress. And uh, <clears throat> we did not know that there were less than 800 Russians in Alaska at any one time. I mean, something as simple as that. And so how many Europeans does it take to, to establish sovereignty over a subcontinent-sized territory that you know, could stand up to any kind of a legal system? I mean, they just had a thin presence on the Aleutian coast, the Gulf of Alaska coast, down to Sitka. And even there, in 1867, when the doors shut at night, the fort, the Russians were inside, and the, Ru and the Indians were outside with the, with the cannon pointed at them. It's not like they had control. And, and so, you, in any case, uh, that, that's history, but nevertheless, it's, it's not ancient history. Right? Anyway, um, between 1867 and 1924, we had no rights as citizens of this country. We could not own land, we could not vote. We could not file for a mining claim in our own territories. Right? In any case, uh, that's, that's, that's part of the history uh, that brought us uh, you know, to the Constitutional Convention. And uh, the reality is that uh, you know, we, we lived in a colonial world and it's not a word that I even thought about that much as I, as I turned 24 and got elected to the legislature and began to deal with the system. We, we just didn't have any sense of history. Um, and so um, we did not understand the nature of what was taking place in our past, starting with uh, Sheldon Jackson, uh, who was both paid as an agent of the Presbyterian Church and as a government official. The power of church and state that began to impinge on our lives, who they began to determine what was right and what was wrong, what was sinful or what was legal. And um, of course his philosophy was we were to be learning English and so that we could be fit for the social and industrial life of the white population and promote their not too distant assimilation. Um, there is a question uh, <laughs> being debated these days about genocide. That's not a word that we use. But in reality, that, that sort of idea smacks of eliminating differences, eliminating languages, eliminating institutions, also art and music, and other things that were meaningful to our civilization. In any case, uh, we tried to make our adjustments uh, because that's just the way life is. You know, when there is a uh, invasive species come ar around, like a bird or a plant, the indigenous species have to try to make their adjustments the best they, they can. And so in, in our world, uh, our predecessors decided that, well, maybe they better start learning how to, how to use the political system, how to vote, how to take you know, some responsibility for what's taking place in their environment. And, uh, but, but at the same time, the very basis of our existence were, were being ruthlessly 
uh, destroyed. I mean, the, the whaling world directly went at the livelihood of thousands and thousands of people up north who depended on, on the 30,000 bowhead whales and the tens of thousands of walruses that were later reduced to 10% of what they were before in the 1800s. And, and they began to hunt the walrus for the ivory by the tens of thousands for the ivory. And then they began to sell the alcohol because it was so profitable. It had gigantic impacts upon our people. And also in Southeast Alaska, thousands of years, the uh, indigenous people there had managed to f figure out ways to uh, control uh, the streams. Certain people had rights to streams and certain people had rights to utilize those streams, but they were productive. But after 1867, you know, the canned salmon industry literally built canneries from all the way from Southeast Alaska to my hometown in, above the Arctic Circle and they basically began to privatize salmon through the use of the fish traps, causing great distress among those people who had a dependence on, on, on that source of livelihood. And on top of that, of course, the, the migratory bird treaties turned us into virtually instant criminals because we needed to hunt migratory birds in the spring as a change of diet, and uh, yet uh, it was illegal. We, and we had, no, no, of course, no consultation on, on, that, on issues like that. But nevertheless, we tried to be good citizens. Uh, we, we fought in World War II, fought in the Korean War. Uh, my own parents joined the Alaska Territorial Guard when Muktuk Marston, uh, you know, came out there to organize the scouts. Uh, we wanted to protect our country. And uh, however, as time went on, we began to lose our population. Majority. Uh, by uh, 1950, we, there was about 128,000 in Alaska. By 1960, 226,000. That was the year after statehood. So we, we were now in the minority. And of course, this is normal. I mean, that is the formation of states out west, you know, took place as soon as the Indians were put into the reservation and under control. And enough of a non native population came, you know, to form a government. That's the American process. It was not our idea. But did anybody take the time to go out to our villages, to be able to talk in our languages, to try to explain what was happening and what was going to happen? I doubt it. And um, uh, the, tr the truth of the matter is that we weren't there at the Constitutional Convention. Sad to say, I, it was before my time. I have no idea why uh, our people didn't see the significance of the importance of the work that was being done with the Constitution. Because we had native politicians, and the first Senate president was an Eskimo guy from uh, Haycock. Uh, I knew his family. Um, nevertheless, the issues that plague us today sort of have their roots in, in that document, the absence of concerns about land, about languages, about participating, participation in the in our educational system, uh, the, the importance of fish and game to our lives. I mean, if there had just been a, a few phrases that would have given the jurist, you know, some direction on these issues, that would have been great. I mean, there's no recognition whatsoever, you know, of the, of the tribal governments that existed at the time. None. And, and, and let me give you an example of how uh, the Constitution affected my hometown. Before statehood, we had a tribal government there. As soon as the fourth class city, Title 29, came into effect, the non-natives organized a city government, quickly took control, invited the, fish, uh, the uh, BLM in to survey, didn't give us a real choice about whether it should be a general town site or a native town site, and before you know it, they bought up literally the entire spit on which Cotsby was located for $50, cent, $50, $75, $100 a lot. Those lots are now $40,000 or $50,000 a lot. So we today have become squatters, you know, and renters because of what they did. I mean, I'll never forget challenging a BLM, and next thing I knew, there was a plane load. Burton Silcock, the state director, came to Cotsby. I was literally the only one standing there. <laughs> 
because our people didn't understand what had transpired. When I asked Edith Bullock, who used to be a board of regent, and I used to work for her, uh, she said, oh, well, we decided that we're not going to charge the people who sit on the lot for the operata cost of that lot. Big deal. <laughs> anyway, that's just an example. So I'm, I'm kind of going on and on. But uh, the reality was that uh, in those days, in, in 55, there were still elements of racism, sad to say. Uh, it was only 10 years before that they had uh, passed the Indian civil rights law that eliminated the, like the no dogs and, or natives allowed or natives, only, uh, natives need not apply signs around the state. And uh, I've seen covenants in Rogers Park and uh, Turnigan where we were not allowed to buy you know, a lot uh, unless you were a servant. Right? And, and so uh, when I got to Juneau, uh, the only thing we had for elders uh, was a pioneer home. Well, the pioneer home was, sadly, it was not for us. <laughs> and when I, uh, but I did fight to get some facility for our elders in Kotzebue, and I had to do it under the pioneer home, home uh, law because uh, that's the only thing we had going for elder, elderly people. And so, but the law said applicability to natives. Any Alaska native receiving aid from the U.S. government is hereby ineligible. We couldn't get into the pioneer home. In any case, that was one example. And then I discovered that uh, what kept the organizations that discriminated on the basis of race uh, in business was a state liquor license. And so I thought, well, we, we shouldn't condone that. So I crafted a bill that would prevent the issuance of a liquor license that discriminated on the basis of race. It became a humongous issue. They called it the no booze for bigots bill. <laughs> and it created just great consternation, you know. Uh, and in the end, uh, they basically gutted it by saying, well, when the Supreme Court rules against it, we will comply, you know. But nevertheless, th this was the kind of uh, environment that we lived in. Uh, and, uh, and, and sad to say, uh, when it came to the unorganized borough, that is rural Alaska, I mean, the boroughs were ba basically for the urbanites, right? And the unorganized borough was all those 200 villages out there that were in this, and the legislature was to sit as, the, as a, a borough assembly for the unorganized borough. Well, the reality is we, we did not even have in there any kind of mechanism for regional planning, right? That could have been very useful uh, for us. Um, so uh, that's just some of the history. I um, won't go into you know, uh, other details, but uh, the good news is that this is America. And thank God that Seward decided that this part of the world should become part of the United States Empire. <laughs> because had, had we stayed with the Tsar, we would have literally no rights whatsoever. Our land rights would be about as deep as the reindeer could chew. There would be nothing like what we have today insofar as uh, our land settlement is concerned that Richard Nixon, bless his soul, helped us get. But the reality was we had to fight the miners and the businessmen and the forest people, almost everybody, who didn't believe that we had the ability and the, and, and the, and the sense uh, to manage our own affairs. Bob Atwood fought us tooth, tooth and tongue, starting way back in the 40s over, over reservations. Never believed that we would be able to help develop Alaska. But now, with almost 200 million acres of our land tied up in some federal park or refuge, maybe they would have supported us for another 20 million acres. That would help us all, because after all, our land is about the only land that's now private that can help us with our future resource development. And uh, so those are just some of my observations and uh, in involvement. Um,
Uh, I think it is a great constitution. It would have been greater had it recognized the fact <laughs> that we were here and had been here, but uh, like I say, uh, we, we weren't participating uh, with, with one out of 55. Our thoughts, our values, our history, our issues, many more simply not reflected uh, in that document. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Sky Starkey. I'm, <clears throat> uh, my father's Lakota. My mother's German. I've been in Alaska for about 40 years and practicing uh, Alaska Native <coughs> law for about 30 of those. My primary practice is subsistence hunting and fishing and tribal rights. I really want to thank Willie for uh, expressing so eloquently what I've heard from many Alaska Native leaders about their exclusion from the Alaska Constitution. Um, I'm going to focus my comments mostly around Article 8 of the Constitution because I feel like that's probably the most sig significant part of the Constitution, or at least one part of the Constitution that would have had a significant revisions if there would have been Alaska Native representation. While I, I am talking, I'd just like you to consider and keep in mind, and for those of you who have a copy of the Constitution, you can read it, the preamble, which I had not really focused on before, but the preamble says, we the people of Alaska, grateful to God and to those who founded our nation and pioneered this great land in order to secure and transmit to succeeding generations our heritage of political, civil, and religious liberty do you ordain and establish this Constitution. The words pioneer were actually raised in the context in that pre pre preamble of the Constitutional Convention by Muktuk Marston, who, and the, this dialogue is covered very uh, thoroughly in Vic Fisher's book, where Muktuk Marston pointed out the preamble and the pioneers, but also pointed out how Alaska Natives were excluded from that preamble. And out of fairness and justice, he argued that there should be a provision in the Constitution that acknowledged, particularly, the issue was fishing sites for Alaska Natives and how they deserved control and title and to be secure in those because they weren't. People were walking in and taking those without regard for their rights, and they were losing their fishing opportunities. That was defeated, uh, never even came to a vote. Instead, the uh, constitutional delegates cast it aside and declared it would be a federal issue, ignoring, in my view, the fact that there were 100 million acres of state land that were going to be under state control regardless. And everybody at that con convention either knew or should have known that the subsistence way of life was essential to one quarter of the population that was not represented. In contrast, if you look at the Hawaii Constitution, the preamble states, we the people of Hawaii grateful for divine guidance and mindful of ho our Hawaiian heritage and uniqueness dedicate our efforts to fulfill the philosophy decreed in the Y state motto, Umawi ka'i ake ana kapano, Hawaiian language. What a difference in preambles, what a difference a few delegates made in their constitution. Article 8 uh, is the part of the constitution that defines uh, use of natural resources for the state. It was, again, uh, Vic Fisher's book does an excellent job of laying out the debate, but honestly, as I look at Article 8 in the Constitution, one of the prime motivations of the people that wanted statehood was the development of natural resources and to be in control of that without the federal government doing so, including fishing, but m mining was also huge. And if you look at Article 8, there are specific provisions about mining. Again, uh, if you look at Article 8, 
you'll see there are the policy in Article 8 um, is uh, basically uh, to uh, has to do with the, de the development of uh, resources consistent with beneficial uses. There's the common use clause, which has been interpreted for public trust doctrine. But um, there's nothing about uh, subsistence hunting and fishing in there. To the contrary, what is in Article 8 are in the enshrinement of equal protection to ensure that uh, natural resources, uh, there's no special privilege for, for natural resources. Um, again, if one looks at the Hawaii Constitution in contrast, they have a Section 7 in their Constitution which says, the state reaffirms and shall protect all rights customary and traditionally exercised for subsistence, culture, and religious purposes and possessed by the native Hawaiian tenants. So again, uh, Article 8, I suggest to you, would have been significantly different with Alaska Native participation. And it was um, intentionally not included and, and left to the federal government in the Statehood Act of the Disclaimer, which uh, has actually not, <clears throat> not ever been uh, used, uh, as in, in my knowledge, uh, by uh, the Alaska State Courts to protect any kind of subsistence or native hunting fishing rights that have to do with state jurisdiction, state lands. This becomes even more important in Alaska than other places. Lower 48 tribes, as we know, have reservations. They have Indian country. They have self-determination. They have places where they can protect their culture and their hunting and fishing and their resources. In Alaska, as we know, the prevailing thought is that the state of Alaska gets to manage even native lands. I disagree with that. I think there's another theory behind that. That's for another day. But the prevailing thought in the current practices, even on those angst lands, those 40 million acres, the state of Alaska, the Board of Game, the Board of Fish, dominated by commercial and sport interests, regulates those lands. So Article 8 becomes even more important than in other states that actually uh, have um, where, where Native Americans have some, some control over their lives. Um, just in terms of a question, so what would happen now if the Alaska Supreme Court uh, took into consideration when it looks at these issues the fact that the Alaska Natives were excluded a quarter of the population? The Alaska Supreme Court does look at historical factors, the, the context, the historical context of uh, the amendments when, or the Constitution when it was enacted. But to my knowledge, uh, in, and I have read nearly all the cases that have to do with Article 8, there's never been any kind of explicit or even implicit um, recognition uh, that about this exclusion. Uh, about the failure to look at, at native hunting and fishing rights in, in the Constitution. Um, the, uh, the, if you look at the, the way Article 8 has been interpreted, uh, or the Constitution in general, there are a couple of places, in, and I'm only speaking about constitutional cases, where the Alaska Supreme Court has actually acknowledged uh, the historical and con continuing context of the importance of subsistence hunting and fishing, not only as to nutritional and economic values, but culturally. And one of those was uh, in the, um, uh, the Frank v. The, the State case, which enshrined under the First Amendment of religious freedoms uh, the right to uh, take moose for potlatches. And there they very much uh, relied on the cultural practice and the need to do that and, and as a religious freedom. But again, that wasn't an Article 8 uh, case. And then in the Alvarado case, the, the, which secured the right uh, for Alaska Natives to be chured, uh, to be have uh, Native people and village people on juries, they again looked at the cultural differences between Native villages and urban areas and hunting and fishing practices. But again, this was a due process sort of claim. But in the Article 8 context, um, 
and in hunting and fishing in general, it's very interesting uh, to me anyway to look at the early cases that came out in the 70s when I think the jurists were a little bit closer to the Constitution and the delegates. And in those early, in those 70 cases, uh, the Van Tananaw Valley Sportsman versus State, for example, in 78, the Supreme, the Supreme Court recognized very explicitly in a footnote the continued importance for the culture uh, and the well-being of native villages to have opportunities to hunt and fish on their lands and use their resources. Um, but then in the 80s, and particularly in the mid and late 80s and the early 90s and through the 90s, out the 90s, the courts started to look at Article 8 and the tension between the rights of Alaska natives to continue their way of life and equal protection as viewed in the, by those courts started to really surface. And then you saw the McDowell case throughout the, the, uh, the, the rural priority uh, and uh, equal protection became the drive. It was no longer the court recognizing how important subsistence uses were necessarily and needing to make accommodations for that. The drive became equal protection uh, and, not, and, uh, and, and a really a great concern for actually uh, urban uh, residents access to uh, subsistence. Um, the worst case in my, uh, my opinion is really not McDowell. Uh, the worst case is, I think, uh, the worst case on the record is the Knightsey case in 1995. In this case, uh, the uh, court not only found that rural, uh, not being rural was not good, but that even when the resources become incredibly short and nobody but subsistence users can use them, the priority, that um, uh, you couldn't uh, weigh the proximity to the resource, the lo how close the resource was to the user. You couldn't even weigh that. That would be a violation of equal protection. Very, uh, in my view, a very uh, superficial analysis that followed straight along McDowell, that it was residency-based. And it was an equal protection analysis, and there was very little weighing uh, of how compelling the subsistence interest was and, and the fit. Also in the Knightsey decision, and probably even worse in my view, uh, the court found that it was not a violation of equal protection to deny the Knightsey Indian tribe, who's, you know, the Kenai River, the peninsula, everybody's named after them. It's been their homeland, it was their homeland forever. It wasn't their fault that a lot of people moved around them. Didn't mean that they necessarily changed their way of life. But uh, the court found that it was not a violation of equal protection to deny them the right to hunt in their traditional territory, even though other tribes everywhere else in the state had that right because they were not declared non-subsistence users by the legislature. Absolutely no analysis about the cultural importance of it, the historical context of the Constitution, just simply that there is no right to have a convenient access to subsistence resources, failing to acknowledge that uh, subsistence uses by Alaska Natives are very closely tied to their traditional territory. But on the light side of things, this current Supreme Court and recent decisions, uh, one uh, by Judge Tan that was affirmed the Manning case, uh, starts to now roll back. Uh, this equal protection analysis starts to narrow it a little bit, starts to recognize the importance of subsistence uses. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court in its most recent, I think, significant decision actually started to recognize that the subsistence statute is, protects a culture and a way of life. And so it's starting to evolve that way. But to this day, and even in those cases, there's no acknowledgement about uh, the, the failure of the, the Constitution to, to look at this. There's no historical uh, context. And I think that might be the fault of perhaps lawyers uh, not making these arguments to the Supreme Court and, and raising them in this context. And this has been the enlightenment for me uh, in, in, in looking at, at how to make this presentation. I thank the Duke Law Review and Ryan and others for uh, allowing to us to do this. Finally, before Andy gets up here, I just want to briefly say that in, in response to some of the uh, suggestions about uh, constitutional conventions and
and um, uh, commissions, I think maybe many of you know that uh, after the McDowell decision in the 90s, there were actually five special sessions where they tried to get a constitutional amendment on the ballot that would uh, recognize subsistence as a constitutional right. Uh, there were actually, in terms of commissions, there were two special, one commission by Governor Knowles and one by Hickel that actually did make recommendations for statutory and constitutional changes. We needed two-thirds of the legislature, uh, both House and Senate, we could not get it. So constitutional change uh, may be possible, but it's certainly been an exhaustive process so far and unsuccessful. My ultimate goal as a lawyer representing Alaska Natives would be to convince the Supreme Court uh, to take a look at the exclusion of Alaska Natives and to read into the Article 8 an implicit right, a constitutional right for subsistence hunting and fishing by all people in Alaska, Alaska Natives and others who are actually and genuinely living uh, that way of life. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Andy Erickson. And I've been working with Willie and Sky. I'm really grateful for their expertise. And, and my role in this is trying to figure out how to do that, how to look forward and make the argument to the Alaska courts to bring back traditional and cultural history and context to the interpretation of Article 8. And one of the ways that we think that that could be possible is looking at how the federal courts have addressed similar issues. Um, the federal courts, since the early 1800s, the Marshall Court, have implied a method of interpretation called the Indian Canon of Interpretation. And this looks back to treaties and statutes that were made with Indian tribes throughout the country. And it says that those treaties and those statutes should be interpreted with, their, with the intent in, in mind from what the natives perceived as what was going to happen from the treaty. So looking at the native perspective and giving all the benefit of the doubt for ambiguities in favor of the native interests. And we think this is one, one way to analogize to a Supreme Court interpretation in Alaska that says that Article 8 should be interpreted in light of the context and the traditional and cultural history of Alaska Natives and bringing that in to the interpretation, recognizing that, that those subsistence uses are what Natives would have believed the Constitution was protecting. I think that it can be said that no, none of the Alaska Natives at the time would have thought or approved of a Constitution that takes away those rights, their way of life. And so putting that back in and having Alaska courts recognize that, making the argument is, is something that I think is going to be very important going forward. So, thank you. Um, are there any, we can take like maybe about five minutes, or if there are any questions or comments from the audience. And I, I do have, let me unmute it. I do have a microphone. Now this doesn't amplify. I, people have been asking me if this amplifies. Unfortunately, this is just for the recording purposes, but. I was just curious if any of you have thoughts about the recent decision out of the Fifth Circuit uh, that the Indian Child Welfare Act is not constitutional. <laughs> How long do we have? Yes. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, I've got. Thoughts. They're more like nightmares, I guess. Um, you know, if if uh, if if so, Justice Thomas has made it clear that just he does not uh, agree. So, uh, just as a little premise, the way the federal courts look at equal protection, they do an equal protection analysis. Um, they don't do an equal protection analysis if it's a if it's a legislation for the benefit of of Indians as tribes. They uh, get around that through the decision called the Mancari decision by uh, saying that it's not a racial uh, determination, it's a political determination that there's tribes and that springs all the way back to the Indian Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Justice Thomas years ago expressed his belief that that it was time for that to be overturned and go away. So the danger of a, any case coming now before this Supreme Court, uh, including this possible ICWA case, is that 
they'll fall back. They'll uh, look at the the, uh, the um, Mad Carey case, and they'll start to do away with anything uh, that has to do with uh, legislation for the benefit of Native Americans. And it also, in, with the points Andy made about the canons, the canons are a completely uh, Supreme Court uh, structured uh, way of looking at Indian legislation that has been hugely beneficial to Native Americans. And this court could certainly not either choose not to apply them or, or completely roll them back. So we're, con you know, we're concerned. <laughs> Just a question for Willie. Um, do you, do you, were there, in fact, any uh, Native people who ran for delegate and did not win? Or was that so uh, foreign to them that they, you know, if you know? That, that actually is a mystery to me. Uh, but you have to remember back then we had, our languages were fairly viable back then. So a lot of people didn't, re didn't really understand the nature of the significance of, 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 of statehood and also of what was drafted in the Constitution. Remember, we had uh, only the Postal Service, right? And generally speaking, in English. So, um, so I think uh, <clears throat> there may have been uh, uh, maybe a lack of understanding of the, of the significance of what was taking place. Um, and uh, like I say, I think there were language barriers. Our, our, our people were spread out over 200 villages all over the state. And uh, as far as I know, there was no special effort to really explain uh, what, you know, um, just a simple thing as whether to mine or not. We spent years in our region talking to our villages about the, the, the impact of potential impact of mining, the change that mining would, and yet, and yet when it comes to something as consequential as a, having to live forever with some document that we had no participation, you know, there, there, was, there was no such effort. Of course, of course, the state was, I mean, the territory was poor. I mean, there was hardly any money. I understand that. But still, um, and getting around was very difficult. So, like I said earlier, I, I don't know why the Bill Belses or the William Pauls or others who actually had served in the territorial legislature didn't, uh, didn't, maybe they were out whaling or something. I don't know what they were doing. They were, <laughs> you know, they're tr probably trying to make a living, you know, and uh, travel was not that easy. So th there could be a whole variety of reasons that, uh, that I don't know about. Like for, for you scholars out there, I mean, you younger ones, I mean, it's a great, great area to take a look at because, you know, we got into the battle from the get-go. We had no chance to try to go back in history. We, we just had to deal with the issues that were at hand, you know, uh, starting, starting in the 60s because our land was being stolen <laughs> uh, by the new state. And uh, in, in, the, in the one semester I thought as a lawyer, I realized that, you know, the moment the Secretary of Interior signed a interim interim conveyance under the Statehood Act that we were never going to get that land back. That that was an extinguishment of Aboriginal title. And that, that was my aha, trying to think like a lawyer. The, 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 good, the good news is that the Congress uh, did not outright extinguish our underlying title. That would have solved all the problems because we would have had no rights. But the, but the reality is under the law, you know, uh, Indian title had some substance to it, and its and its, and its extinguishment was compensable. Uh, the the problem the problem was it was compensable like one cent, <laughs> you know, uh, on the dollar, uh, and it took forever, you know, to go through the court of claims or the Indian claims. Commission. So, so we we really did turn around U.S. history, 200 year history. Uh, all of a sudden, they were conveying land, but uh, and, and so. When uh, people talk about two cents an acre, well, not exactly. You have to throw in the value of 44 million acres plus about a billion dollars, you know, to that price. Well, I, I can give a direct answer. About 10 years ago, I looked at <coughs> the issue, and uh, as I remember, I have it written down, but 
as I remember now, there were about eight or nine natives who ran for the Constitutional Convention. There were four in Southeast running at large in the whole Southeast region. Um, um, Frank Baratrovich was elected. Oh, there were eight, I think, eight members, eight natives in the territorial legislature at the time. Um, and I think seven, seven people, natives ran for the Constitutional Convention, four at large in Southeast. Uh, Frank Barotrovich was selected. He was a territorial senator at the time. Uh, he had been elected at large. Andrew Hope of Sitka was within a limited number of votes uh, from being elected at large. And then there were two others. I can't remember their names. There were three people, three natives who ran in the Nome, the Western District, and uh, um, uh, they, there were local seats as well as a regional seat. And the three of them ran f for the regional seat, and none of them were elected. Mm. Uh, they, could, they got enough votes. A couple of them could have been elected at the local level. Mm -hmm. Um, that was about it. At the time, uh, to many Alaska Natives, and I had worked in rural Alaska before the Constitutional Convention, and people were generally not connected to this ethereal concept of a constitution for a future state. Uh, most natives lived in small, isolated communities. Uh, Kotzebue, as you know, was a good example. And John Cross, who was a very popular uh, pilot who flew fr between villages in the Kotzebue area, he was seen as their representative. Uh, he, he was married to uh, in a new Pierre woman and had a big family and they were at the Constitutional Convention much of the time. But uh, they, they saw John Cross as their representative because the convention was not really relevant to most of the life in rural Alaska. They didn't think. Sounds like it turned out to be negatively relevant. Willie came later. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know that there are other people who may have comments. I do want to give people uh, the opportunity to get lunch. We'll break for about 10, 15 minutes, then we'll come back with our lunch presentations. But uh, first of all, thank you very much for our wonderful presenters. <laughs>